I will uh, let's continue with uh, with what we were talking about before, and uh, let's construct a, a public key crypto system from this ring LTPV problem. The public key crypto system will be both efficient, will have small public keys, small ciphertext, and it will also be homomorphic, in the sense that you can take a encryption of a message and you can compute encryption of any function of the message. Okay, um, okay so let's. Uh, This is due to uh, Lubyshevsky by Kurt and Greg. Uh, the, same, the same set of folks who introduced uh, this problem. Okay, so what is, uh, how does this work? Uh, the, uh, the public key in this system is a pair of polynomials. It's A and AS plus E. So I'll call this B. And both these are Uh, polynomials in uh, CQ of X mod of X. Right, it's a pair of polynomials in this uh, in this ring. The secret key is is S. Okay, and um, uh, what is uh, what is important here is that both S and E come from um, both S and E have small coefficients. Okay. This is very different from what uh, all the encryption schemes that we have seen uh, before, where uh, the secret, either the LWE secret or the ring LWE secret, was random. It's always random. And now I'm saying, you know, to get uh, efficiency, uh, choose S from, uh, um, uh, from some distribution with small coefficients. Okay. Um, how do I encrypt? I'm going to encrypt a message. Um, so I'm going to encrypt a message in uh, uh, the same type of message as before, uh, which is a polynomial. with coefficients in ZP. Okay. The encryption is going to look uh, the, following. the following. It's going to look like A times R plus F. B times R plus F prime plus the message times Q over B. Okay, so, so let's look at it a bit more closely. I'm going to think of uh, the public key as a pair of polynomials, A and B. But B is computed in this special way, but forget about it for a minute. I'm going to uh, come up with the uh, with polynomial R. R, F, and F prime have uh, small coefficients. Okay, where in the ciphertext, okay, so I'm going to come up with a polynomial R with small coefficients. It's the same type as S. I'm going to compute A times R plus F. Okay, F is also small. So this is, this looks very similar to uh, to the public key. I'm also going to, going to compute B times R plus a different error. A different uniform, you know, independently chosen error f prime, plus the message. Message again scaled by q over p. Okay, so this is the this is how you encrypt. Why does this work? So how do you decrypt? Well, let's uh, compute 
uh, my secret key is S, right? So I'm, I'm going to use this secret key to decrypt. What I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to take uh, the second component. I get the ciphertext, which is a pair of uh, elements. Um, OK, so let me uh, write it in that level of generality. So decryption using the secret key S, it gets a pair of uh, polynomials. It's a ciphertext. And I'm going to compute C1 minus uh, uh, C0 times S. Okay. The first thing I do is compute C0 times S. And what is this, uh, what is this polynomial? This is uh, B times R plus F prime plus the message minus C0, the first component, times S. Okay, I just rewrote uh, uh, C0 is this guy, and C1 is this guy. So I just rewrote uh, this expression. And now, uh, let me substitute for B. What is B? B is A times S plus E. Okay, so I get A times S plus E times R uh, plus uh, an error plus the message so on and so forth, minus A times R plus F times S. Okay, so now the point is that there is a common term here, which is A times S times R, which cancels out. Okay, and what is left is the message times Q over P plus the following uh, terms, E times R, okay, it comes from here, F prime that comes from here, and F times S that comes from here. Okay, it's a lot of terms, you know, that you that you collect together. But the point is that all these polynomials are actually small. Why? Because E is small, R is small, F prime, F and S are all small polynomials. Okay, so when I compute this uh, uh, the sum of uh, products, uh, this guy is going to be fairly small. And then I can, you know, I can fig I can decrypt the same way as before. I just, you know, check, you know, what is the closest multiple of uh, uh, Q over P that this, uh, uh, what is the multiple of Q over P that this is closest to? Okay, so that gives me the message. The same thing as before. Okay, so this is the uh, this is the encryption scheme. And the, in the so why is this secure, right? Um, the main sort of um, the difference between this scheme and all the previous schemes is that uh, the LWE secret here is a small polynomial. It's not a uniformly random polynomial. So if you look at the definition of the ring LWE problem, it says that if I get samples of this form for a uniformly random polynomial, that is hard. I cannot distinguish that from that. But that's not the case here. I'm talking about uh, you know, a small polynomial. Right? So why is this hard? In fact, it turns out to be uh, it turns out to be hard, and that is that is a lemma. So, so ring of the Bui. So when I define ring of the Bui, um, I uh, have to talk about the dimension, the modulus, and the irreducible polynomial, and also an error distribution. Chi. Okay, what is this error distribution? It's a distribution that produces polynomials uh, with small coefficients, relatively small coefficients. Okay, it's some error distribution. I don't care what this error distribution is. But there is this. Okay. So what this lemma says is that the ring and the where the secrets, the secret S comes from the error distribution, is as hard as ring and the with uniformly random secrets. So that's what, I mean, once I prove this, I am more or less done, because uh, what this says is that the public key uh, is um, 
computationally indistinguishable from random, and then I'll show the proof uh, in a couple more steps. Okay, so this is really the main sort of technical obstacle uh, to the proof. So why is this true? This is actually a very, very, very simple proof. Um, so, so let's um, let's try to think about what uh, uh, what what we have to do to prove uh, to to uh, to do this proof, right? So we have to show that if there is an algorithm, we have to show a reduction, which uh, says that if there is an algorithm that solves uh, Ringel W E where the secret comes from uh, the error distribution, then there is an algorithm that solves Ringel W E where the secret comes from the uh, uniform distribution. Okay, so what this uh, setup means is that I know that th th there is an algorithm that solves this problem and I want to use this algorithm as a subroutine uh, to solve uh, the bigger problem, namely the Ringel W E with the uniform distribution. Okay. So what does this algorithm get? You know, I'm supposed to solve Ringel W. So what is my input? I get a couple of samples. A1, A1S plus E1, and A2, <coughs> A2S plus E2. Okay. Let's say a couple of samples. Where S comes from the uh, uniform distribution. And I'm supposed to uh, distinguish this from random using this oracle what does this, what, using this uh, subroutine, and what does this subroutine expect? It expects Ringel WE samples where S is chosen from the uh, uh, error distribution. Okay. So how do I generate inputs for this, uh, uh, for this oracle? Let's look at, let's say, A1, uh, B1 equals A1S plus E1. Okay, this is the first sample that I get. Let me rewrite it in the following way. So I can re I can write S as B1 minus E1 divided by A1, right? So A1 inverse times um, B1 minus E1, right? I mean, I did nothing but just rewrite it. And now the second sample, what does it look like? It looks like B2 equals A2S plus E2. Which is the same as B2 is the same as A2. S is in fact A1 inverse times B1 minus E1 plus E2. Okay. This is the same as A2 A1 inverse B1 minus A2 A1 inverse E1 plus E2. Okay, so what did we do in this, uh, when you manipulate it this way, what did we do? In this sample, where the secret is in fact, so so let's, uh, let's actually forget about this quantity. So this is a quantity that you can compute publicly, right? Because you're given A1, A2, and B1, so you can compute this. So let's forget about it for a minute. What this says is that this sample, which is a ring of WE sample of the uniform secret, is the same as this guy, which is a Ringel W E sample where the secret E1 is drawn from the error distribution. Okay? In other words, to be a bit more uh, uh, precise, I'm going to uh, construct a sample A prime B prime, which is equal to uh, minus A2, A1 inverse, comma, B2 minus A2, A1 inverse B1. Okay. It's a complicated looking term, but what this, uh, what this is, is if I compute B2 minus uh, A2, A1 inverse B1, I get minus A2, A1 inverse times E1 plus E2. So what is this? This is a polynomial. This is a polynomial times a secret, an LWE secret, plus the, the LWE, ring LWE noise. OK? 
Okay? In other words, this is a ring and WE sample where both the secret and the error come from the same distribution. Okay. Um, the, the bottom line of this uh, reduction is this. Okay, you get a whole bunch of samples from LWE. Okay, what is an LWE sample? It's a linear relation between a secret and an error. Right. So um, you can write the secret in terms of the error. That's what the ring LWE sample does. Or you can write the error in terms of the secret. Okay. Once you do that, you can uh, you can construct many samples uh, where the secret is drawn from the uh, from the error distribution. Okay. So once I get the sample, I feed it to, the, to this box, and that's okay because this box expects ring LWE samples where the secret is drawn from the error distribution. That's what I have. It's exactly what I have, and uh, you know, it gives me it either solves the search version of the problem, in which case you know it gives me back uh, well essentially E1, which I can then use to uh, find what S is. Or it solves the decision problem, in which case I can use this to solve the decision question here as well. Okay, so this is a very sort of simple reduction. The bottom line is that, you know, in Ring LWE, you don't care if the secret comes from the uniform distribution or the error distribution. It's really the same. Uh, they're equally hard. Okay, so now given this, how does the, uh, why is this theme why is the public key uh, crypto system secure? Let's uh, let's look at A times this plus C plus B. This is the public key and an encryption of a message, right? And uh, what we will do is as before. We will show that the ciphertext looks pseudo-random. Okay, so ciphertext looks computationally indistinguishable from a random pair of polynomials, which means that it completely hides the message. Okay, this is exactly what we did before. So how does it work? The first thing we do is uh, let the public key be a pair of use the hardness of ring LWE. Right? If you look at the public key, it's supposed to be a ring LWE sample but it's computationally indistinguishable from a completely random sample. Okay, so let this be uh, be uniformly random. Okay. And then the encryption, it looks exactly the same as before. Namely, A times R plus F and, and this quantity. Okay, so that's, that, that's what I do to the public key. Let me do the same thing uh, to the ciphertext. So what does the ciphertext look like? The ciphertext looks like A times R plus F. Okay, in other words, uh, a ring LWE sample where the secret is R, and I get a multiple plus a noise, another multiple of R plus another, you know, uh, an independently random noise. Okay? So it looks like two samples from a ring LWE distribution. By the assumption, uh, these two look like uniformly random samples. So these look like, um, so the ciphertext, uh, PK, as before, namely uniformly random, and the ciphertext looks like a uniform, two uniformly random polynomials plus the message. Okay? This is clearly uh, you know, uniformly random. There is no information about that. So we know U1 and U2 are uniformly random, but there could be connection between them. No, not really, because. Um, uh, what Ring LWE says is that if I give you uh, many samples, so the form, you know, A1, R plus noise, A2, R plus noise, and so on and so forth, they look, together, they look uniformly around. Okay, so, so that's exactly what it is. It's A times R plus noise, B, which is uniformly random and independent because of what we did to the public key, times the same R plus an independently random noise. So together, they look uniformly around. Okay, that's from the assumption. Uh, plus the message, therefore it's uh, okay. So uh, technically, the the difference between this and the other security proofs, the, really the only other security proof that we have seen, is that in those in the proof of Ragif's uh, uh, crypto system, we did this. We took the public key and we changed it from an LWE sample to a uniformly random sample, right? 
And that's the only time we use the LWE assumption. From then onwards, it was all sort of an information theoretic proof, right? So then what we said was, you know, we do R times A, and that looks statistically close to random, no assumptions, and that's that, right? Whereas here, we use the assumption twice. Once to change the public key to be a uniformly random uh, pair of polynomials, and once again, in the cipher text, when you change that to a random uh, pair of polynomials. Okay, so uh, once you sort of use the full power of uh, this computational assumption, you really get a, a tight and efficient uh, encryption scheme. Okay, so how efficient is this encryption scheme? Uh, okay, so before we go there, any questions about the scheme, proof? Yes. Uniformly random. So it is the assumption of uh, being uh, yes. Yeah. So I didn't write it down. Ah, I did write it down. A is a random form, uniformly random polynomial uh, in the appropriate space. Right. Degree n minus one polynomial where each coefficient is random and secure. Uh, yeah. And A and the random. So, so on the one hand, I have A and AS plus E. On the other hand, I have A and uh, random, random polynomial. They can't distinguish. And in fact, I, I get not just one A, but I get you know A1, A1S plus E1, and A2, A2S plus E2, and so forth. So if I get polynomially many samples of this form, I can't distinguish it from a sequence of samples where the right-hand side is all uniformly random and random. Okay, so that's what the ring of is. Okay, so that's uh, this is the scheme. Okay, good. And what's nice about the scheme is that it's really, I mean, it has small public keys, it has small cipher text, and everything is you know nice and um, efficient. Let, let's actually so calculate these numbers, see how efficient it is. Um, what should I erase? So why is this efficient? Well, the length of the public key is, uh, and um, yeah, the length of the public key is 2 times n times log q. So there is two polynomials, each of which uh, takes n log q bits to, uh, to write down. Okay. The cipher text, well, to encrypt n times log p bits. This is the length of the message, right? Because the message here is a polynomial. It's a degree n minus 1 polynomial with coefficients in zp. So that's n times log, log p bits. What is, my, what is the length of my ciphertext? It's a couple of, uh, it's two, two polynomials in zq to the uh, zq vex mod f vex. Okay, so this is ciphertext is 2 times n log q bits. So if I set uh, p to be um, square root q, let's say, uh, the ciphertext expansion is a factor of 4. Okay? So, so it's a constant factor of, uh, it's a constant factor expansion between the message and the ciphertext. And the public key here, so before the public key was n plus uh, 1 times m times log q bits, where m is uh, m is roughly n log q. Okay? Um, so the, the size of the public key improved by a quadratic factor. Okay? So before it was roughly n squared log squared qubits, and now it is n log qubits. A quadratic factor is actually a big, big, big improvement. So it's the difference between a, a megabyte and a kilobyte of public key. Okay? So it's a, it's a big deal. Um, Okay, good. So, uh, and also, the, the operations in this scheme are polynomial multiplications, right? Multiplying two polynomials mod x to the n plus 1. And this can actually be uh, computed fairly efficiently. I mean, you use uh, tricks from uh, uh, FFT, fast Fourier transforms, and so on and so forth. And that can also be done very efficiently. Okay, so the scheme is, uh, this is 
really the most efficient, um, one of the two most efficient uh, lattice-based uh, systems that I know of. Okay, so efficiency is one great feature of this encryption scheme. That's not it. The scheme is also uh, homomorphic. Okay, so that's the next thing. Next and the last thing I'm going to show in this lecture. Once I'm done with it, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I didn't get a chance to speak about, which is a lot, actually. Uh, and I'll hopefully give sort of pointers and references to, uh, to all these things. Okay, so why is this? Uh, so let's, uh, let's do this. So why homomorphism? Okay, uh, so what I want here is a procedure called a val, which takes uh, as input a ciphertext C, which is supposed to be an encryption of M, and a function F, and outputs an encryption C prime, which is supposed to be an encryption of F of M. Okay, in other words, if I take the ciphertext and decrypt it using the secret key, I'll get F. Okay, this is, that's the kind of thing I want. So how do I do this? Well, what I'm going to uh, do is I'm going to write this function as a combination of addition and multiplication operations. Okay, and once I show how to add two ciphertexts and multiply two ciphertexts, you know, multiply the underlying messages in the two ciphertexts, I'm done. Right? Because I can write any function as a combination of addition and multiplication operations. Okay. Uh, to do this, uh, uh, so it turns out that this scheme by itself is not homomorphic. You have to change it by a little bit. And what you have to do is the following. So if you think about, okay, so, so let's uh, change, change the encryption algorithm. to be the following. Let me uh, forget efficiency for a minute, and let me talk about encrypting uh, bits. Okay. In fact, I can encrypt sort of large messages, the same type as before, but let's focus on bits for a minute. Okay. Um, and the ciphertext is going to change a little bit. The first component is going to look exactly the same. Right, AR plus F. The second component is going to be BR plus, well, I mean, if I, if I do the same thing as here, this should be BR plus F prime plus M times Q over 2, right, because I just went from uh, ZP uh, to Z2, so and then this becomes Q over 2. But this turns out, this turns out to be not, uh, not homomorphic, and that's because um, uh, what we are doing here is if you look at this error term, I am encoding the message, encoding M, in the most significant bit of the error. Okay. What do I mean by this? I'm going to think of this as one polynomial. Okay. If I take um, the most significant bit of each coefficient of this polynomial, I actually get the message uh, that was encrypted. If it, if it is 1, I know that the message encrypted is 1, otherwise it's 0. Okay. So think of uh, a particular coefficient of this polynomial. You know, let's say you know, it is... Uh, one zero 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 one. Okay. Yes. M is a is a is a is a bit. So it, so to encrypt it, uh, construct a polynomial which is zero all over the place except the constant uh, term which is zero or one, which is the message. It doesn't have to be this way. M can actually be a polynomial. 
whose coefficients are 0, 1. In fact, the coefficients can actually be over ZP. Doesn't matter, but just, uh, I mean, in fact, think about whatever works for you, really. I mean, both are, you know, fine. Okay, so uh, in any case, what, uh, what works here is the following variant of the encryption scheme, where um, I encrypt the message as um, B times R plus twice an error plus the message. Okay, so this is really um, two times B times uh, 2 inverse R, right, plus F prime plus 2 inverse R, so 2 inverse B times R plus F prime plus M times uh, uh, Q over 2. M times 2 inverse. Okay, so this is uh, equal to 2 times a different B times R plus F prime plus M times. What is 2 inverse? It is roughly Q over 2. It's Q plus 1 over 2, in fact. Right? So this is Q over 2. So this ciphertext is really a scaling of a ciphertext of that form by a factor of 2. That's the only thing I've done. Okay? But the representation of uh, the ciphertext matters, and in fact, this is the, so whereas the old scheme was not homomorphic, I can prove that the new scheme is homomorphic. Okay, so this is, this is what, I, um, uh, what I want to focus on. And by, you know, by doing this uh, change, I didn't change the security at all, because, you know, like what I wrote, uh, the new ciphertext is twice the old ciphertext. So I just multiply the ciphertext by 2. That cannot change security. Okay, so this is the second text. So why is it additively homomorphic? Okay, so let's, uh, so what do I want to show? I want to show that if I get an encryption of M1, an encryption of M2, I can compute an encryption of M1 plus M2. Okay, so that's what I want to show. Okay, so is it true or not? This is this is actually the easier property to uh, to satisfy, and uh, and this is actually so. Let's take uh, the two ciphertexts A R one plus F one, B R one plus two F prime one plus M one. So this is the encryption of M one. Okay, the encryption of M two, which is A R two plus F two, B R two plus two F two prime plus M two. And I simply add the two uh, ciphertexts together. First component of the first component, second component of the second component. Okay, so what I get is A times R1 plus R2 plus F1 plus F2, right? And you know the, what you expect here, right? 2 times F1 prime plus F2 prime plus the sum of the two messages. Okay? When I decrypt the ciphertext, what I'm going to get is M1 plus M2, the mod 2. Okay, so it is really an encryption of the sum of the two messages. Okay, questions? Good. The hard part is to show that the scheme is multiplicatively homomorphic. And that's always uh, the hard part in these constructions. Um, and that, okay, so let's see. So maybe I should erase this because this is simple. Multiplicative homomorphism. I get encryption of M1 and M2, and I want to compute the encryption of M M1 times M2. Okay. To do this, let's look at the ciphertext again a bit more closely. And let's rewrite this as, let me call A times R plus F as A prime. Okay, I'm just renaming it. And what is B times, uh, uh, B times R? It is A times S plus E. Okay, so wait, hold on. 
sorry, I'm going to change this a tiny bit. I have to make this uh, 2 times f, and I have to to change the public key to be 2 times e. So whenever I multiply you know, the error with a number that is relatively prime to the modulus, it's actually OK, because this is equivalent to uh, 2 times 2 inverse a times s plus e. So this is an LWE sample. I just multiplied it by 2. Okay, so I didn't change the hardness at all. So now, what does it look like? It looks like 2, t two times e times r plus 2f prime plus n. Okay. So this looks like a prime, a prime s This guy looks like AR plus 2F times S. Okay, so I want to, my point is to write this down as a ring LWE sample. Okay, once I write down the ciphertext as a true sort of, so, so right now it's a pair of ring LWE samples. I want to write it down as a single ring LWE sample. Once I do this, multiplication is, you know, follow straightforward. Okay, um, so I do this. Uh, so I can write this down as AR plus 2F times S. So the AR times S term uh, comes up here. I added a 2 times F times S term. So that's it's something that's, that does not appear here. Plus 2 times E times R plus 2 times F prime plus the message. Okay. The bottom line is that this looks like AR plus 2F. AR plus 2F times S plus some error plus 2 times an error plus the message. Okay. Uh, now, what is a times r plus 2f? This guy is really, um, so this is computationally indistinguishable from a uniformly random vector. And a prime times s plus 2e double prime plus n. Okay, so that's what it, uh, it looks like. Structurally, this is what it looks like. Okay. Um, and now, uh, so given this representation, um, we can see why the scheme is multiplicatively homomorphic. Okay, so let me take uh, two encryptions: encryption of M1 and encryption of M2. Okay, so this looks like um, a. So let me just sort of uh, rename things and. Uh, call this A1. A1, A1S plus 2E1 plus M, M1. And A2, A2S plus 2E2 plus M2. What I call A1 here is really the A prime, but I'm going to sort of throw away the primes for the sake of sanity. Okay, so I have uh, these two ciphertexts. How do I multiply them? To? How do I compute another ciphertext? which decrypts to the product of these uh, two messages. Okay, so the obvious, I mean, the first idea that uh, you can think of is, well, this guy has an M1, and this guy has an M2. Why not multiply them together? It's, it's an obvious idea. And, uh, and let's see what happens if you do that, okay? So you have A1S plus uh, 2E1 plus M1 times A2S plus 2E2 plus M2. Let me call this uh, C1. Let me call this C2. OK, so this is uh, an expression I can open parentheses, and it becomes a huge sort of uh, nine-term expression. I want to write it down a little bit, in a little bit more clever way. OK, so I want to write it as a term that contains s squared, right? Because there's an s here, there's an s here, so there is an s squared. Yeah. Plus a term that contains s, 
plus two times an error plus the product of the two messages. Right? So this is the kind of uh, form that I want for the final expression. So in fact, you can check that this can be written as minus a1, a2, s squared. There's a minus here, which is important, plus a1, c2, plus a2, c1 times s. plus 2 times E1 M2 plus E2 M1 plus E1 E2, 2 times E1 E2, plus the product of the two messages. Okay. So this is still a fairly complicated expression, but the point is that I can write it down as uh, a, a quadratic expression in the secret key. Right? Uh, there is a S squared term, an S term and a constant term. And the coefficients of all these terms I can compute publicly. Okay, so the coefficient of s squared is a1, a2 minus a1, a2, which I can compute because I know a1 and a2. The coefficient here is a1, c2 plus a2, c1, which also I can compute because I know both a1, c1, a2, and c2. And, and that's that. Okay, so I'll give you a moment to check why this is correct, right? So this is, uh, this is sort of the, a little bit different from the obvious way of, uh, you know, decomposing this polynomial, you know, opening the parentheses and writing down the expression. And uh, what is surprising, what is probably a little bit surprising is that there is a minus uh, a1, a2 term here. Okay, so where does that come from? That comes in because I compute a1, c2 here, right? So that has an a1, a1s times c2. Actually. So that has an a1s times a2s term. Right, that, that, that comes in, in in the inside. So that has an a1, a2, a squared term. And this guy, which is a2, c1 uh, times s, also has an a2s times a1s term. So I'm counting this a1 times a2 times a squared term twice. Okay, whereas I should be counting it only once. So that's why I'm going to subtract it, you know, once. Okay, so write it down. You know, this is the format that you get. Okay, so this almost looks like an encryption of m1 times m2. Okay, why do I say, why do I say that it looks like an encryption of m1 times m2? If I, if you forget about this quadratic term, if you assume that this quadratic term doesn't exist, then this looks like a multiple of s plus two times um, an error plus the product of the two messages. Okay, which is an encryption of m1 times m2, except for this pesky little. Uh, term, this uh, S squared term. Okay, what we are going to do um, is to uh, to let this S squared term be there. Okay, so we are going to let. So when I take an encryption of M one and encryption of M two, I get an encryption of M one times M two. Which is what we are going to. Our new ciphertext is minus a1 a2, a1 c2 plus a2 c1, c1 times c2. Okay. So why is this? So look, uh, look at the ciphertext. Before uh, the output of an encryption algorithm is supposed to be a pair of polynomials. Right? To encrypt a message, I compute a pair of polynomials, and that's what a ciphertext is supposed to look like. But this looks like, this looks different. It looks like a, a, a three-tuple of polynomials. But what is important is that there is a way to decrypt this using the secret key and get the product of the two messages. Okay, so that's what's important. The, the, the homomorphic operation doesn't need to produce a ciphertext that looks exactly like an original ciphertext, all it needs to do is produce something that you can decrypt um, to uh, to the product of the messages. Okay, so this I claim that you can decrypt. Why? Because c1, c2 is exactly this expression that I computed. Uh, and when I have the secret key, when I get the secret key, I can uh, take off this s squared term because I have uh, the coefficient. Compute that times s squared. I can take off the s term as well. And what I have left is uh, two times an error, a small error, plus the message. Okay, 
Once I have this, I take this modulo 2 and I get the product of the two messages. Okay, so that's that. So I just showed you how to multiply uh, two ciphertexts, do homomorphic multiplication, except for a little catch, which is that uh, once I do uh, a multiplication, the number of elements in the ciphertext increases. Okay, before it was two, now it became three. I do it once more, it will become four, and, and so on and so forth. Okay, so if I do, uh, in general, if I do demultiplications, the number of elements in the ciphertext becomes d plus one. Okay, but uh, you know that's okay if you only do uh, sort of a constant number of multiplications. So that's why the scheme is uh, somewhat homomorphic. Okay, but the ciphertext grows uh, linearly with the with the degree of with the number of multiplications that you do. Can you add this to that to a new uh, new one with this this uh, Yes, yes, I can. So, so, uh, so you're saying, uh, assume that I have encryption of M3. Yeah. How do I compute encryption of M1, M2 plus M3? That's what it is. Okay. So I have uh, a ciphertext here, right? <laughs> Call it A3, C3. Right? I just put a zero in here. Okay. So I can. What well, the point is that I can write C3 as A3 times S plus two times an error plus the message, which is equal to zero times S squared plus a3 times s. I can always put in a dummy, uh, you know, s squared term. Okay. Then I add it component wise. That's how I get a, um, yeah, that's how I compute this follow. Okay. And once you have this, you know, if I have two ciphertexts of this form, it's longer ciphertext, I might want to multiply them together, right? To do that, I, I, I again uh, do this kind of computation. I take c1 and c2 and multiply them together. Now they're not sort of linear, you know, they don't have just linear terms, they have quadratic terms. When you multiply them together, you get uh, terms with the degree 3, 4, you know, 2 and 1 and so forth. So, so it becomes uh, even longer. But you can check that uh, once you do, if you do demultiplications, uh, the number of uh, um, terms in the ciphertext is d, d plus 1. How about the error? Good. Excellent question. Okay. So, um, so already, when you add two ciphertexts, the error grows, right? So it was, if it is E1 and E2, it becomes E1 plus E2, okay? When you multiply, it's actually even worse, as you can see from this expression, which is E1 times E2 plus, uh, plus a bunch of terms, okay? So essentially, you know, when, you, when I add uh, two, uh, two ciphertexts with errors E1 and E2, it becomes E1 plus E2. When I multiply, it becomes E1 times E2, more or less. So the effect of this is that you can only do a, a bounded number of multiplications. Okay. So if the original error, so let's say uh, the original error is e, which is let's say polynomial in n. Um, if I do d multiplications, the error becomes uh, e to the power d. Okay, because if, if, I, if I multiply two ciphertexts, you know, it becomes e squared. Multiply a third ciphertext, it becomes e cubed, and so on. And so on. Okay, uh, and I want this error. If this error becomes larger than q, then I can never decrypt because of uh, so, uh, because it sort of wraps around modulo. So this error has to be smaller than q, uh, and q is smaller than two to the n. Right. So um, why is that the case? Because if q is larger than 2 to the n, then the error, the ratio between the error and the modulus is uh, so small, it can actually break the scheme. Okay? So the error is small, and the modulus cannot be too large. Yeah, otherwise, you can, uh, you can break and degree. So this has to be smaller than 2 to the n, which says that d is smaller than n over log uh, e, which is n over log n. The bottom line is that you can do uh, n over log n multiplication. With this, uh, with this, if you set the parameters to be uh, to be the right values, okay. So that's why it's a somewhat homomorphic inversion scheme. You can't compute all functions, but you can compute uh, you know a small number of multiplications and many additions, arbitrarily many additions, uh, exponentially many. Because uh, if I add sort of m numbers, it becomes m times n. 
becomes n times the original error. And, uh, that's it. That's fine. So additions is not the additions are not the bottleneck in this case at all. Multiplications, on the other hand, are a problem. Uh, so it's a pretty cool HD sufficient to audition and show audition and multiplication for it. Yes, but the but the problem here is that neither addition nor multiplication exactly works, right? Because when I add, the error grows. I multiply also the error grows. So you can only do a small number of additions and multiplications. And now, you know, to uh, make it fully home, to make it fully homomorphic, I mean, this you'll see, uh, this you'll see tomorrow. So in fact, it turns out that this scheme uh, can be made uh, fully homomorphic without any additional assumptions, just the ring of degree assumption. In fact, uh, even better, you don't even need to assume ring of degree. You can do the whole, all these things with L of UE. So L of UE is a better assumption uh, because its hardness is related to uh, short vectors in arbitrary lattices, whereas the hardness of ring of UE is related to uh, short vectors in ideal lattices. Okay? So, so it's better to assume L of UE. And you can do all these things with L of UE as well. This is something that you will see tomorrow. UE and L of UE. Not ring of degree. Just a review, you can do all these things. You can make it fully homomorphic. Fully homomorphic, people are thinking fully homomorphic and then uh, ring homomorphic. And, and it's a ring homomorphic. And what is the homomorphic? Is there a big difference between fully homomorphic and then? No. Uh, 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 the, the point is that with a fully homomorphic scheme, you can do as many additions as you want, which you can do here. You can do exponentially many additions and as many multiplications as you want. Okay. But the problem here is that you can only do uh, this number, n over log n multiplication. And that's the point. If you want to sort of make the scheme do as many multiplications as you want. Okay. And that you can do. Okay, so that's, uh, you know, that's really the, the, end of, uh, the end of this lecture. Let me say a few words about things. Uh, um, Wonderful things that we didn't see. We need them to see. So let's continue my question. So, so you mean if we can uh, add and multiply, yeah. then we can do anything? You, uh, you can, if you can add and multiply many times, yeah. you can do anything. But the point is that. Because the fact is it's a big point. It's not just in terms of that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, the point is that you can only do a small number of multiplications. That's that's really the one. So, uh, so as I said before, there is no reason why m is a bet really here. You can have m to be a polynomial, and what you will get here is a sort of polynomial addition and multiplication over this ring, right? So this is, you know, it supports addition and multiplication over. Right. Okay, my question is, uh, even though I, we can multiply any time of this multiplication and addition any yeah. time, mm -hmm. I don't know whether we can compute any Boolean circuit, any function of the line. Uh, you can, right? Because okay. you, you can uh, write any Boolean circuit as a combination of uh, XOR gates, exclusive OR gates, and AND gates. XOR gates, XOR is simply addition mod 2, which is exactly what we compute, actually. So if you decrypt this, you'll get M1 plus M2 mod 2. And AND gate is a multiplication mod 2, which is also what we do. In that case, we have to we have to take the message at the binary. Yes. If we take, if we consider the integer larger, larger, well, but, uh, but you're talking about Boolean circuits, right? So uh, it, has, it takes only this. You can do arithmetic circuits as well. But, but the point is that even if you have an arithmetic circuit, uh, you can write it down as a Boolean circuit, right? Because you can uh, write down addition mod uh, whatever, P, as a Boolean uh, function of its space. It becomes a little bit larger, but it's still a Boolean circuit, right? So, uh, OK, so this is uh, all the, sort of the technical stuff. Uh, what we didn't see, well, we didn't see identity-based encryption. Uh, 
and sort of hierarchical identity based encryption. This is uh, started with the work of Gentry quite good so and you know there's a whole sort of, uh, sort of cottage industry of works that construct various kinds of uh, identity based encryption schemes. In fact, even though I didn't show you the full fledged identity based encryption scheme, we already saw sort of the basic one of the basic components of the scheme, which is the dual records. Uh, second thing uh, I didn't uh, I didn't show uh, is um, is the uh, by request. This is the uh, entry encryption scheme. Entry is really uh, perhaps one of the two oldest um, lattice-based encryption schemes. Um, and uh, till very uh, recently, uh, this scheme, we didn't know how to prove uh, the security of the scheme based on any standard assumption. The best we knew how to say was the scheme is secure under the assumption that the scheme is secure. And uh, that's not very useful. Uh, and what we have uh, recently in Europe uh, 2011, last month actually, uh, by Stele and Steinfeld. So this is actually a very, very efficient encryption scheme. But people, they have a, they have a company that, uh, that sells this inventory. If you have to form a company, it better be very efficient, right? Uh, what you can show is that a variant of this uh, encryption scheme is secure under the ring of the okay. So this, is, this kind of goes back, you know, takes lattice space cryptography full circle all the way to the, to the very beginning. It's a very, very nice result. Um, is there anything else that I'm forgetting? Uh, I didn't get to show fully homomorphic encryption, although I did show a somewhat homomorphic encryption scheme. And this is uh, this you will see tomorrow. Okay, anything else? Uh, a number of you know other systems, you know, circular security, uh, group signatures, you know, name it. I mean, people have been hard at work constructing these systems. Uh, but I think I, hopefully I gave you a flavor of what's going on in landscape space photography and still there's a lot of things. Okay. Thanks for